packed show we have for you in the next two hours. Uh, we're, first, we're first going to be taking a look at how one of the nation's biggest power companies is going after climate change business in China. I spoke with Duke Power CEO Jim Rogers. And it's Ad Week here in New York, and both ad agencies and the media must be wondering if they have anything to celebrate these days. I'm going to be talking about the future of advertising with the head of one of the world's biggest marketing firms, MDC Partners, Miles Nadal. And later, we speak to the former chief of Payne Weber, Don Marin. Marin took Payne Weber from a retail backwater to a major investment bank with a real-world presence, and we know how he did it then in this new financial market. How would he do it now? So we're going to be taking a look back and also a look forward with Don. Okay, let's get you caught up on what the markets are doing right now. Equity futures are indicating a higher open after the declines that we saw yesterday. Dow futures are up right now by 61 points. Treasuries are pressured at this moment. So you do have uh, several auctions occurring not only today, but for the rest of the week, for the 10-year down as well as for the two-year. Uh, the dollar, which uh, we've been talking quite a bit on this program about the recent weakness, uh, now resuming that slide. It is lower against the yen and also softer against the euro. Well, as Fed officials begin their two-day meeting, housing will be on the top of their minds. And this morning, we'll get fresh numbers on housing prices. And John Ehrlichman has more on what it could tell us about consumer demand here, John. Good morning, Betty. Well, what we can find out certainly is what the demand stabilizing story is. The Federal Housing Finance Agency is going to come out in less than two hours with its monthly home price index. Now, this is data for July, a bit of a lag here. But along with Kay Schiller, these two readings tend to give us a good idea about whether the demand demand story is stabilizing compared to, say, home sales overall. And I should point out that the expectation is we're going to see a positive read here, continuing a, generally speaking, recent trend. You take that trend, you couple it with the recent rally in stocks, and then I'll show you another chart which fits into this story. The household net worth here in the U.S., on average, uh, you have seen, obviously, a huge deterioration since the peak in 2007. But the Fed recently came out with their second quarter results. We started to see an improvement for the first time in seven quarters. That's certainly the part of the story that certainly people uh, are, are factoring in, Betty. Right, and John, also another influence out there on housing is mortgage rates. Absolutely, and I just want to very quickly show a 30-year chart of what's been going on with the 30-year mortgage rate, and it is still compared to the last 30 years at a very low level, encouraging perhaps some first-time home buyers to come to the market. Two quick questions. Obviously, that uh, uh, tax credit that's available right now to first-time home buyers set to uh, end soon. And also, the fact that we are seeing that seasonal slowdown, will that affect home sales going forward? Betty? Okay, John, thank you. Well, the global recession continues to wreak havoc on the commercial real estate market. Rents on some of the priciest avenues in the world are down the most in a quarter century. And Monica Bertrand has the details on that, Monica. Betty, it might look like business as usual as you stroll down Fifth Avenue or the Champs-Élysées in Paris, but high-end retailers might be catching a little bit of a break because rental rates on some of the most expensive shopping streets in the world are down an average of 23 percent. According to real estate broker Cushman and Wakefield, prices are down 8 percent on Fifth Avenue and around $1,700 a square foot. Over on Hong Kong's swanky Causeway Bay, rents dropping a whopping 15 percent. As for the fabled uh, Champs-Élysées in Paris, the rents are a little change coming in at just over a thousand bucks a square foot. Now, store rents are falling worldwide as household and consumer spending fall and unemployment rates rise. And uh, over at uh, Cushman and Wakefield, the head of the retail um, the, the head of the retail division there says that the last 12 months have actually been one of the most difficult periods ever for the retail sector. And the real estate broker actually doesn't see any significant improvement in rental growth in the short term. Cushman and Wakefield is looking for rental prices in less profitable areas to continue to fall. And that may give retailers who are looking to move into more swanky digs an opportunity as they rush to take advantage of the declines in rents on the more high profile avenues. Betty, back to you. Okay, Monica. Well, falling commercial property rents and values will continue to dog the financial sector as well, so much so that some banks may need more capital. Let's get to Scarlet Flu for the details on a bearish call, Scarlet. And Betty, this call coming from Mike Mayo of Calion Securities. He says that more commercial real estate loans will go bad, resulting in more credit losses, forcing more banks to raise more capital. Now, the bottom line, according to Mayo, is if you increase risk for two decades, as we have, it takes time to reduce that risk. Don't think you can do that overnight. Mayo says what does seem to have changed overnight is 
is the sentiment. It's somewhat more positive, he says, but I didn't get the memo. This view, Betty, is actually not new. Uh, Mayo actually reiterating his outlook on the banking sector that he first gave in April when he left Deutsche Bank and joined Calion Securities and initiated the U.S. banking sector with an underweight rating. Since April, however, the S&P 500 financials index has climbed almost 60 percent in line with the overall market recovery and certainly leading the way there. When you break that down, however, it's notable that regional banks, as represented by the KBW Regional Banking ETF, has moved a little bit less, gaining only 5 percent versus the XLF, which represents overall financials, up about 60 percent in that period. Mayo says that that makes sense because regional banks are more vulnerable to bad commercial real estate loans, to the exposure there. And just as a matter of background, Betty, uh, since the start of the financial crisis, banks in the Americas have raised $754 billion in capital. That is one and a half times the amount raised by European banks, which is about $480 billion. Asian banks, Asian financial institutions have raised the least, only $106 billion since the start of the financial crisis. And Mayo adds as well that it's not just banks. He says that we could see uh, more corporate failures as a result of this global recession along the lines of an Enron or a WorldCom. So be on the lookout for that as well. Betty? Okay, thank you, Scarlett. Well, NBC Universal may be up for grabs. Vivendi, the French company that owns a 20% stake in the NBC unit, may announce a sale as early as October 14th. Now, that is as NBC isn't performing as well as Vivendi's majority-owned businesses, according to a person familiar with the situation. Now, Vivendi obtained the stake when it sold its media assets to GE, which is NBC's parent company, back in 2004. A sale by Vivendi could lead to GE buying back the shares or an NBC Universal IPO. So what the question is, what is NBC really worth? Well, Bloomberg's Adam Johnson has been crunching those numbers. And Adam, what is it worth? Yeah, well, you're absolutely right, Betty. Investors uh, both here and across uh, the Atlantic think a sale is imminent. Uh, Nick Heyman of Stern AG sees three possible outcomes, and then I'm going to give you those prices as to what it's worth. Number one, uh, GE uh, effectively is not able to buy because it doesn't have the cash. All right, that's issue number one. Uh, number two, a third-party purchase of Vivendi's stake. Well, that could be Comcast, Liberty Media, or Time Warner. Uh, very interesting. John Malone, of course, always mentioned as interested in media assets. And finally, GE joins Vivendi and sells its 80% share, resulting in a standalone, entirely new company. Now, to answer your question, Betty, just what is it worth? Well, let me run you down the, the numbers. Steve Dusa calculates that NBC is trading at about one times cash flow. That's his sum of the parts. He backs that out based upon where GE's trading. Well, he says that is way too cheap. He says one times cash flow doesn't even hold a candle to comparable properties like Time Warner, Viacom, CBS. They trade at about six times cash flow. All right, very, very different kinds of numbers. So uh, what's that worth in total dollar terms? Well. Uh, Steve, uh, Steve Winokur over at Bernstein, he says it's $13 billion. The J.P. Morgan analyst, he says $30 billion. But Nick, uh, Nick Heyman, the Stern AG analyst, he thinks $20 billion. He says that's the fair number. That you apply the sort of multiple where CBS, Viacom, et cetera, where they're trading. He said it gets you to about $20 billion. The real question, of course, is whether NBC ends up sh selling its 80% share. That's the real trick. It's a tough time to sell that asset, says Nick. Nick Heyman. Betty. Okay, Adam, thank you. Well, with crude oil prices going higher, commodity shares are also pushing equity index futures up. And Suzanne O'Hallon has the details from the New York Stock Exchange. Suzanne. Hi, Betty. You know, I am watching some of the commodity stocks today, specifically U.S. Steel. We have Bank of America turning more, more positive on the steel maker, saying they will return to profitability next year as business improves. Already this morning, U.S. Steel shares are up about 2%. That will lend support to this market. Plus, as you mentioned, we are seeing an uptick in a lot of commodity prices, including oil, copper is also on the move higher, as is gold. So the commodity trade will certainly help reverse those losses we saw yesterday, modest losses in U.S. stocks, because U.S. stock futures are moving higher this morning, as you can see on your screen. And I want to say we do have a couple of profit updates to fill you in on. Lowe's, the home improvement chain, did come out this morning and deliver a, uh, a, a 
but negative to neutral profit forecast, Betty. In 2010, their profits may be a little bit weaker than analysts were expecting. And also in the discretionary sector, we are waiting from earnings from Carnival Cruise Lines today. Royal Caribbean, its rival, tends to trade in tandem. So we are keeping an eye on those stocks for you as well this morning. Back to you. Okay, Suzanne, thanks so much. And climate change is in the air. We're going to be talking with Duke Energy's CEO, Jim Rogers, after the break.